Okay, so this is going to be our first communications video looking at section one, humans and other animals are able to detect a range of stimuli from the environment, some of which are useful for communication. So we're going to start with having a look at a bit of a background on what communication is before we get into the syllabus dot points. So communication has been described as the transfer of information or messages from one organism to another. But besides sending messages, we also need to be able to receive messages and interpret them to understand what's being said. For organisms to pass information between one another, signals have evolved over time. When one animal gives out a recognisable signal, such as our peacock here displaying their feathers, it may influence the response of the other individual. So in this case, this is a mating ritual where the peacock displays their feathers in order to show that they're interested and eventually the other peacock um, will hopefully respond in a favourable manner. This communication between signaller and responder may lead to cooperative interaction between members of the community, which we refer to as social behaviour. This is of benefit to the entire group of animals, as obviously in this case, reproduction will take place and the population will continue. Effective communication enables organisms to interact and function more efficiently. Some examples include the interaction between honeybees when they're collecting nectar or pollen, usually using some kind of vibration, uh, nest building with, and raising of young with termite communities, as well as social interactions between humans. Teamwork is often more successful than individual attempts, as we've seen in our own class. This usually results in improved efficiency, obviously, a group as a whole rather than individuals trying to achieve the same thing. In particular, things like hunting, foraging, defending, so defending resources, defending food, defending territories, and also protection of care and young are all teamwork activities that a lot of animal populations undergo in order to achieve a greater outcome. The methods of communication that an organism develops are also closely related to its lifestyle. So we're going to have a quick look at sight and sound. Both of these we'll be looking at in a lot more detail throughout the topic. But sight is a common form of communication. Because light travels in a straight line, travels at extremely high speeds, visual information is effective in providing details such as the distance between you and another, another object or an organism that's coming towards you if you're in the wild and the speed at which it is travelling. In humans, sight also includes reading, but also involves interpreting visual signals such as facial expressions, posture and other forms of body language, which helps to tell us a lot about a person that we're conversing with. Most human communication relies on symbols. As we know, this is a very common symbol that we see um, and it provides us with information that is pretty much known around the world just by simply looking at that signal. Relying on the spoken and written word as a means of communication plays an important part in the cultural development of humans. Its main advantage is in allowing information to reach those not within the range of sight or hearing. Some features of communication that distinguish Homo sapiens from other animals include uh, speech, the ability to think abstractly and to reason, and the fine coordination involved in using tools and obviously writing implements. Sound is used by many living things as a form of communication, but most other animals are unable to produce or detect sounds that humans use. So obviously we are the only ones that are able to form uh, sort of speech. We do believe that other organisms such as our pets can understand us, but it really comes down to the inflection, the tone, the volume that we use rather than the actual words. Communication in animals other than humans is non-symbolic and non-verbal. So as we can see here, um, our little dog, okay, dogs will wag their tail and lick their owners as a sign of affection rather than being able to talk and say, you know, hey, I just met you and I love you. Chimpanzees have been taught to use limited amount of sign language and to even speak a few words, but studies suggest it is likely, sorry, unlikely that animals use symbolic language in nature. Most animals that use sound as a form of communication recognise the actual call or sound made for identification purposes rather than it actually symbolising a particular word. Communication therefore involves both the sending and receiving of meaningful messages. 
for effective communication, the communicator, so that's the person or the organism that's sending out the message, needs to have a device to be able to create those signals. We as humans have a voice box or a larynx for sound production. We'll be having a look at the larynx and the vocal cords and how that works a little bit further on in the topic. Some examples of signaling devices that animals have are bright coloration of their bodies, such as their feathers for visual mate attraction, and glands that secrete chemicals to mark territories like our panda here that's rubbing himself against a tree and lets other pandas or other organisms know that that's his spot. The recipient, so that's the person that's receiving the signal, must also have a suitable sensory structure to be able to detect the signal. A dog that bears its teeth and growls would be an ineffective communicator if the recipient of such a behaviour did not have eyes to see the aggressive display or ears to hear the growling. Sensory structures that detect changes in the environment are receptors. Animals, including humans, use all five senses to communicate. Effective methods of communication therefore rely on a corresponding development of visual communication, so being able to see, acoustic communication, being able to hear, tactile communication, which involves touching, and chemical communication, which involves smelling and tasting. And we have a whole heap of different receptors that are able to deal with each of those different five senses. So that brings us to the end of the first dot point. Okay, so I just said that that was the end of the first dot point, but that was actually just the end of our little introduction to uh, communication. So a little bit of a look back at what communication is, the importance of communication, and now we're going to get stuck into the actual syllabus dot points taken straight from the syllabus. So the first two dot points that we're going to look at are the first one being identify the role of receptors in detecting stimuli and explain that the response to a stimulus involves five things, being the stimulus, receptor, messenger, effector, and response. I'm hoping that a few of these things are triggering little memories in your brain back to our maintaining a balance topic where we looked at homeostasis and we looked at the stimulus response pathway. So this part of it's going to be fairly quick because we have already looked at how a stimulus brings about a response in a number of different things. We're just going to have a look at it in particular to do with communication. So you may recall that a stimulus is a change in either the internal or the external environment of an organism. So living organisms are able to pick up or receive stimuli using our receptors. In their most simple form, receptors can consist of a single cell, which can be scattered anywhere over the body. However, in most organisms, the receptors have become concentrated areas known as sense organs, such as our eyes and our ears. So in particular, in those two organs, there's a whole heap of these receptor cells that are able to detect different types of stimuli. The sense organs contain non-sensory tissue, aside from the spe special sensory cells that can monitor stimuli. So our eye really only has a very thin layer of receptor cells, but all the other parts that are involved in our eye help us to be able to see. So a response we recall is a reaction to an sorry, a reaction in an organism or its tissues as a result of receiving a stimuli. The pathway exists whereby a stimulus is detected by our receptor and a message is carried to another part of the body by our nerves. And once the message gets to the brain and then the message comes back, a response is triggered. So for example, if you touch a hot stove with your finger, receptors in your skin detect the heat and pain, causing you to withdraw your finger rapidly. The coordination of this action requires a link between the receptors that detect the stimuli and the effectors, which are the muscles or sometimes glands that bring about our response. If the response isn't enough to counteract the stimulus, then the receptor will detect that and the cycle or the pathway will continue until the response is enough to stop the stimulus. The link or coordination, sorry, this link or coordination is carried out by our nervous system, which is made up of our brain and our spinal cord, which are our central nervous system, and then our nerves of the body, which make up our peripheral nervous system. In our stimulus response pathway, the response is related to the intensity of the stimulus. So obviously the stronger the stimulus, the stronger the response. So when listening, 
when listing, sorry, the different types of receptors, people group or categorize them in different ways. Receptors are commonly classified according to the type of energy to which they respond. So firstly, we have our eyes. So the stimulus that our eyes obviously respond to is light. In our eyes, we have our retina, which is the very back layer of our eye, which contains photoreceptor cells. These are made up of two particular types being rods and cones, which we'll be looking at later in the topic. And their job is to detect light, color, and movement. We then have our ear. So our ear obviously responds to the stimulus of sound. In our ear, we have mechanoreceptors. So when you think of mechano, think of movement. So mechanoreceptors in our ear are right all the way in our inner ear in a particular part called the organ of cordy. And they're tiny little hairs that vibrate in response to the frequencies that we're hearing. Then we have our tongue. So our tongue responds to the taste of our food. On our tongue, we have chemoreceptors. So chemo, chemicals, the molecules that are dissolved in our food give us a different taste. Now, this image here shows the different um, areas of our tongue broken up into the different flavors. They actually believe now that this is incorrect and that our tongue just has sort of a, a, a blanket of different taste receptors that taste all the different flavors all over our tongue rather than being broken up into different sections. We then have our nose, whose job is to respond to smell. So in our nose, we have a different type of chemoreceptors that detect the molecules in the air. So again, chemochemical molecules, this time um, they come up into our nasal passage and they cross the membranes and um, the chemoreceptors in our nose are able to detect our different smells. And lastly, our final sense is obviously touch or pressure. So the skin is able to detect pressure, again, with mechanoreceptors, which are on the surface of our skin to detect pressure that occurs. So the reaction of an organism to a stimulus is termed a response, which we've just looked at. The central nervous system, that is the brain and the spinal cord, which here is the pink section of our picture, the brain and the spinal cord um, is the one that triggers the response. Receptors in the sense organs are connected to the central nervous system by all these blue nerves. So every part of our skin has nerve endings somewhere. Okay, some areas are obviously, obviously contain a lot more nerves. Um, people that are ticklish on the bottom of your feet. Okay, that's because of the nerve receptors that are there. So uh, photoreceptors in our eye, we said connect to our brain. Touch the receptors in our skin. Um, also connect to our brain via nerves. So if we were to have a stimulus touch our finger, the receptors, so the mechanoreceptors in our skin would detect the pressure and then we would have a message being sent to the central nervous system along the nerves. So these messages are being sent as electrochemical impulses, which we will be looking at in a lot more detail a little bit later on. And then what happens is once that message gets to the brain, the central nervous system processes it and says, right, okay, what do we need to do? interprets the information and a suitable response is initiated. So the central nervous system will then send a message back along the nerves to the effector organs and the effector organs job is to then carry out our response. So as we looked at in the maintaining a balance topic, our effectors could be muscles or they could be glands depending on the what the response needs to be. In the example of touching a hot plate, the withdrawal of the hand is a response triggered by the central nervous system. So it needs to be very quick to avoid injury. Nerve impulses are sent along the nerves to the muscle of the arm, causing them to contract and withdraw the hand from the heat. So the muscles are our effectors. Contraction of the muscles is the response. Another example is a response to a loud knock at the door, which causes you to look up. In this case, the brain will interpret the information and send messages to the muscles of your neck and eyes to trigger a response. Obviously, somebody knocking at the door is not as important as sticking your finger on a hot plate, 
So the processing may be a little bit slower and you won't react quite as quickly. The brain and the spinal cord interpret and make messages, sorry, and make sense of the messages they receive, either by taking into account past experience or as an inherited reflex. Some examples of reflexes are blinking your eye when someone moves towards them rapidly or unexpectedly, jerking away from a source of pain, or the widening of the pupils of your eye as you enter a dark room. A typical example of a response in terms of past experiences is when your mouth begins to water at the smell of somebody baking bread or biscuits. A stimulus in the form of information being received by receptors is processed by the brain and spinal cord and a message is sent via the nerves or messages back to the effectors where the response is brought about. And it's this stimulus response pathway that leads to the development of behaviours in different animals and then leads to the development of communication within societies. So that now brings us to the end of our first two dot points. And you have a secondary source investigation to do that's in your booklet. Thanks, guys.